Thank you. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. And, uh, oops, hopefully I'm getting up. And, uh, anyway, I want to thank the organizers and the, and the conference supporters and the audience for, for turning out tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to come here for a conference set on uh, innovations in education. Uh, I was told that I should give you guys a little background why I'm so interested in teachers. And uh, I came about that interest for two ways. One, it was teachers that were the early ones on me that got me where I am today. Starting with my mother, who was a teacher, until later in her life she changed to become a principal. Don't hold that against her. But uh, she did an excellent job of both, I think. But when I uh, became a professor, I came, went to the University of California, uh, I was given many opportunities to go to schools and talk. But it very quickly, I learned that training teachers was going to be a much more effective way to reach students than just going to a few classrooms and giving talks. You're there for a couple of hours and that's it. Whereas the teachers are there all the time. And so I thought, well, I can pay back some of the teachers that helped me along the way by helping teachers that were struggling in the material. So now we run a teacher's academy uh, in Berkeley every year where we train teachers that learn how to teach uh, astrophysics and, and particle physics and cosmology. And I, we managed to get it in France added to the curriculum of astrophysics. And we also teach a school about teaching uh, cosmology and astrophysics to, uh, to teachers. And we, keep, we have websites and so forth to do that. And have, the thing that I have learned from that is it's great if you have two things. One, the excitement. So we always show people what's the exciting and beautiful part of science and physics today. So in my talk, I'm mostly going to show you some of the exciting and wonderful things we've been discovering lately, and we're going to continue to discover, and we'll really hear about that. And the other is to give them some hands-on experience. Give them material they can use in their classrooms. Give them students they can work with, and things like that, and those things. So tonight, I'm going to sort of uh, talk to you about learning the universe, because one of the things you find when you're teaching science is because of the existence of the World Wide Web and advances in science, it's a joint experience between the teacher and the students about learning. The teacher knows all the basics very well, but when it comes to the newest stuff, the teacher and the students learn that together by going consulting. So in talking about learning the universe, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to cosmology. And I'm going to quickly talk about mapping the universe. So this is something that you know the great explorers, the conquistadors that came and mapped the world and explored the new world and so forth and so on. But here it's a little more complicated because we have to do it in a way where we're trying to explore the universe not only in space but in time. And I'll show you how we do that. So we use a lot of the tools. You can turn the lights down a little. Anyway, this is supposed to have the background of fingerprints. And uh, so I call this the cosmic scene investigation, like the, the crime scene investigation, where we try and look at the relics and the clues that we have and then match them to our databases and to our computer models and so forth and see how well we can, we can reproduce what has happened over time and how well it uh, leads to our understanding of what's going on. So, We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but I will start with some of the first evidence we have to. And you will see the challenge for people who are doing cosmology is you must explain the entire universe. And that, it's not, it's not, it's, it's like a thing to do. So here's the Hubble Space Telescope. Oops, turned the wrong way. Here's the Hubble oops, too far. Just the, the Hubble underneath. Field. It's a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Hopefully. Here's the picture. So in this picture, we can get the lights down. If not, you only see the, the brightest objects. 
you will see, if you look very carefully, uh, only two of the four stars that are actually in the picture, but you will see nearly 2,000 galaxies. So here's a picture that was taken of a sort of a random spot out in the sky where nothing was known to really exist. And in it, you see some stars, but behind those stars, you see a lot of galaxies. And so the orange thing you see there, that looks kind of like the sun, that's a relatively nearby galaxy that's elliptical in the institution. There is next to it, down below it, and around it, a number of spiral galaxies. Hopefully we can get these lights. It's the front row that are most important. Ah, okay. So now you can see some of the galaxies. On my screen, I can see the 2000. You can see maybe a couple hundred here. But you will see there are some nearby galaxies that are kind of big, that are kind of colored like the sun, and there are some additional galaxies that are not only elliptical, but are spiral. But behind them, there are lots of tiny blue and white galaxies. And those blue and white galaxies, even though we're much further away, than what we're seeing earlier in time, and we're seeing that galaxies are changing over time. So this simple picture, this one picture, we see there's a lot of galaxies, many more galaxies, than you would think you would need if you just wanted to create a place for men to live. For human beings, so this gets into the entropic principle. But there are, in this picture, around 2,000 galaxies. We know in our own galaxy there are almost 400 million stars, and we know behind every star, when we look anywhere near a star, we always see a galaxy behind it. So, in principle, if we had this, the space telescope at our disposal, we could see over 100 million galaxies just one after the other, you know, taking pictures 2,000 at a time. And, uh, so that's part of the problem we have in trying to understand the universe. The first question is, why are there so many galaxies? Why are there galaxies? Why are there so many galaxies? And how did they come into existence? Right? What's the history of so forth? Then how did those galaxies have their stars and all the planets and so forth? So one of the things that's very exciting in science these days is the discovery of planets that might be habitable in a, around other stars. So we're sort of doing an inventory, and we measured a couple of thousand galaxies around other stars. But if you sort of project that forward, you would guess that there's roughly four billion planets in our own galaxy that are potentially habitable. So there's there's roughly one for every family in the, you know in, in the, in, on the world today, and uh, perhaps one for every person. So this is now a daunting problem. So what do we use for our cosmic scene investigation primary tool? And we use the fact that the universe is very, very big, and that even though the speed of light is very fast, the universe is so big, it takes light a long time to get to the existence. So in this picture, in the center, we have the Earth, just because it's convenient when you're on the Earth to draw a picture with the Earth in the center, not because the Earth is the center. And if you look out, and you look out at the light second, you'll see something about as far as the moon. And as you look at the distance, it's a light second away. It takes light one second to get there. You see the moon. That's the only thing you see. If you go out to 10 minutes, the only sun, the sun is eight light minutes away. It takes light eight minutes to get to us. And so you can ask yourself, well, does that ever matter if I take a picture of the sun like here? Well, the answer is the sun is changing. And you do care occasionally because there are giant sunspots. And they send out flares, and those flares can disrupt communications and airline flights on the Earth. Fortunately, they take a lot of time, longer time to get here than light does, so you can actually have warning and, and prepare for the, the kind of events. But if you just look out to Jupiter, you're still only less than an hour away from the Earth in light travel time. But it's on the scale of an hour. But if you look out to the nearest stars, so the nearest 50 stars, it takes light about 10 years. So if you take a picture of a star, the nearest star, you're actually going to get a picture of what's going there 10 years ago. And if you do something like go out to the nearest big galaxy, Andromeda, and imagine your government has given you great money and they, you built a huge telescope, and you focus it on the Earth and you take a picture, what will you see going on, on the Earth? Well, it takes like 2 million years to get to your telescope. So the light that's arriving now came from the Earth 2 million years ago. There's no humans. There's no. There's the continents and the oceans, but there are no humans. There's no Great Wall of China. There's no, you know, 
pyramids in Mexico, there's nothing. Uh, just any sign of, of mankind. So I was talking to, to the anthropologist earlier today, and he said, we only go back, you know, you know, a million years, and that's that's all the further we, we think about things. Maybe one point four million, but still not two million. And yet that's the nearest big galaxy. You take a typical galaxy and light will take a billion to ten billion years to get to. So if you then look as far as you absolutely far can see, you can see back to the radiation that comes from the very beginning of the universe, when the universe was much hotter and much smaller, about a thousand times smaller, and that's what we call the cosmic background radiation, and that's represented by the pink and the blue signals on the outside there. And that's a, that's a map of what we can observe and understand our universe from, even though we believe the universe extends much further than that. So our goal as cosmologists is to take advantage of the fact that we can get samples of the universe from different epochs. All we have to do is look out to different spheres. As you go out a certain distance, you go back a certain time, distance of time. So if you want to trace out the history of the universe, you just trace out samples of the universe over distant distances away from it. And that allows you to do it. So here's an artist's sketch of what this looks like. We live in a spiral galaxy. So just like we put the Earth before, we put the spiral galaxy in the center. It's slightly offset because we live in one spiral arm of the spiral galaxy. So we live in that the little spiral that sticks down. So that's actually the center of the sphere. And around it are galaxies, spiral galaxies, and elliptical galaxies that are more evolved that look pretty much like our own galaxy. Whereas if you go further out, around the edge, you see these sort of blue and purple galaxies that are irregular shapes. They're rolling younger galaxies and they're new, and they're starting out to form. Sometimes they merge together to form the more advanced galaxies. But it takes a while for the first generation of stars to start you know, cooking, making the material, spewing it out, and the new generation of stars and planets coming out. That's the kind of thing that's going on in the history of the universe. And so the overall picture is this picture, called the cosmic spheres of time. There is us in the center. And then around us are spheres that contain at least 100 billion galaxies. So the number is a little low in the drawing, but this is just so you can see. But you have to imagine a very large number of galaxies. And then a time period which we call the dark ages, where there are no stars and no galaxies, so when the universe is, is fairly dark. And then back to when the universe, uh, its temperature when the light left, was as bright as the surface of the sun. But now it's much colder, it's a thousand times colder. So instead of being 3,000 degrees, it's 3 degrees. Really low to the so that, this is the, the kind of mapping and stuff that we're doing. And I'm going to show you some results. And I'm going to show you just a quick picture of a, paper, of a, of a drawing that came from the paper that was put out about a month and a half ago. And this is the Earth in the center. And you can see our galaxy arcing around it, or in the galaxy. But when you look towards the center of the galaxy, it's much brighter than you look in the opposite direction. And then the first set of galaxies, and then more sets of galaxies and radio sources. And finally, the radiation from the beginning of the universe. And so this is, this is where we are. And you'll see some places the maps are fairly much covering the sphere. Some places there are big gaps. And what you'll see is we only have a partial map, but we're in the process of making a lot more maps. However, I have been spending a lot of my career looking at this radiation, we call the cosmic microwave background. It was the cosmic background in those days. But uh, over most of my career, and it started with ground-based and aircraft and balloon flights, and finally the Kobe satellite in 1989, when we made the discovery and announced it in 1992, that we had found the universe to be extremely uniform, but there were variations that are part of 100,000. So the universe is almost perfect, but there are these teeny variations. And that spurred the uh, NASA and other people to fund another satellite, which is called the WMAP satellite, microwave <laughs> probe, which was launched in 2000, so roughly 10 years later. And it had higher rank resolution, and it saw these kind of more detailed patterns. You could see more of the bumps and the spots in there. And then we launched the Planck satellite in uh, May of 2009, and it has more frequencies and higher resolution. 